Coincidental. Chapter 5. The Case for a New Christian Culture The claim is often made by some Christian thinkers that Christianity has not yet spent its full forces and that accordingly, the Christian era is just about to begin. In view of the biblical insistence on the correlation of faith in God and secularity, it is necessary that this correlation reflect and not disparage the actual secular reality and its structures. But this reality and its structures indicate the aspects of a culture modified by and dependent upon time and space. Therefore, it is important that faith should understand its correlation to the secular as contemporaneity with it. Consequently, the problem dealt with in this chapter has two aspects, whether Christianity can be relevantly correlated with modern secularity, and whether modern secularity allows such a correlation. Practically, the whole chapter deals with Maritain's philosophy of religion and culture. This choice is dictated by the eminent role he has played within Christianity and non-Christian circles. Twilight or Dawn Whether a society is Christian or not can be determined by the extent to which its members practice Christianity. And whether a culture is Christian or not must be judged by the extent to which Christianity leavens its creative imagination. It is obvious that Christian practices have been abandoned or that men pay less and less attention to them. One interpretation of the meaning of this phenomenon is set forth by T.S. Eliot in his The Idea of a Christian Society. He writes, A society has ceased to be Christian when religious practices have been abandoned when behavior ceases to be regulated by a reference to a Christian principle, and when, in effect, prosperity in this world for the individual or for the group has become the sole conscious aim. But, Eliot adds, a society has not ceased to be Christian until it has become positively something else. Similarly, a culture has not ceased to be Christian until it is being positively informed by some other principle than that of Christianity. But an increase in church attendance is not necessarily a positive indication of a revival of faith, nor is the interest of the churches in the political or social situation of the world a sign of the vitality of Christianity. This interest may be born from considerations extraneous to the core of Christianity. It is not uncommon for a dying man to make one final affirmation, but that will not bring back life to his dismembered spirit. An example lies in the recent turmoil in the Belgian Congo. The highest rank reached by any Congolese in the security forces of that country was that of a non-commissioned officer. Obviously, the withdrawing Belgians had not done all they could to make easy the transition from Belgian to autochthonous administration. Despite these realities, a book on the contemporary situation of Catholicism published prior to the independence of Congo praises the work accomplished there by Christian missions. It says that the Congo is one of the most remarkable achievements of Catholicism, and for this reason, deserves a special mention. Just what are these achievements? In the Congo, 75% of all the newspapers were Christian. Three motion picture companies are owned by Catholics, as well as 157 theaters to show these pictures. Add to these an equally impressive number of educational institutions, and it will seem that practically all the cultural activity of the Congo was Christian in its inspiration. The tragedy is that it was, but no one who in the summer of 1960 read the newspapers would have suspected it. To what extent is the fate of European and Western culture different from that of the Christian missions in the Congo? As an organization, Christianity lives on, even under totalitarian regimes such as those of Eastern Europe. More is said and done about or in the name of Christianity today than in the 19th century. There is a closer affinity between religion and philosophy today, in spite of their clearer distinction, and in spite of certain radically dissenting viewpoints, than there was at the time Kant subsumed religion under morality, or Hegel engulfed it into an abstract philosophy of history. In the fine arts, too, religion has in the last decade made a comeback the importance of which far exceeds the spectacular publicity of the revival of the 50s. If all these signs cannot blindly be regarded as pointing to the vitality of the Christian tradition, can they be considered as an attempt on the part of Christianity to cope with the problem of the contemporary world? 
On what grounds is the claim made in many Christian circles that Christianity is today more conscious of its responsibility than ever before? It is a fact that Christianity is today better aware of its obligation, and that this awareness can be objectively substantiated. For example, 19th century Christianity was essentially deprived of the sense of detached contemporaneousness. It lacked the courage to affirm itself in the midst of spiritual, economic, and social changes that could not be avoided and that should have been brought about by Christianity itself long ago. Even the Reformation, which understood the necessity that Christianity stands or perishes according to the degree of contemporaneity with the world in which it lives, even the Reformation acted as an instrument of cultural emancipation only insofar as it could not do otherwise. It was itself the result of a new phase and a new orientation in the national or personal consciousness of the peoples or individuals who held a common faith, but did not see how this common faith in its traditional aspect could meet their situation. Today's Christianity is increasingly aware of the necessity to meet the present situation. More and more high-ranking posts, and the Roman Catholic hierarchy, for example, go to non-Europeans or non-whites. The World Council of Churches holds important meetings in non-Western countries in order to show the universality, and thereby, the contemporaneity of the Christian faith. More decisive than these indications is the fact that in the realm of theology, no emphasis is made which does not somehow concern the need for speaking to the present situation. Whether the particular label of contemporary theology be neo-Thomism or neo-Protestantism, it reveals an undeniable concern for a theology of imminence in the affairs of the modern world. Archaizing theologies do subsist, of course. They are unavoidable in any society. Nevertheless, the question remains. Is not this need for contemporaneity an indication of obsolescence? The question is not cynical, but very serious. Forced on any analysis of the modern world by the observation that Christianity has traditionally been a religion of the future life, no less than one which has sanctified its past accomplishments and has clung to them. Suddenly, it seems to want to be part of the modern world and its destiny. It is natural that the basis of this claim should be questioned. Although religion must be somewhat circumspect in its attempt at contemporary relevance, Christianity today again and again proves to be too hesitant, too cautious, too opportunistic in this regard. There is on the one hand a proud recollection of the praiseworthy ideals of the priest workers of Paris in the midst of the proletarian mass of unchurched people. Side by side with this commendation is a silence on the part of Catholic Christians, who praise only indirectly or privately the intention of this peculiar apostolic action while they directly and publicly endorse its unjustified suppression by the Vatican. So far as a feeling of relevance depends on the view that Christianity is the only real bulwark against materialistic atheism, the problem of today is not atheism, but the progressive lack of currency of the Christian ideals. A passage of the act suppressing the priest workers' activities states that no nation, such as France, where there are still so many baptized people, can be considered de-Christianized. And so long as there are so many baptized people, it is not necessary to alter the traditional conception of the priesthood. Obviously, contemporaneity was measured by the persistence of time-honored practices and customs, regardless of their present relevance or their actual irrelevance, in keeping with Eliot's claim that no country has ceased to be Christian until it has positively rejected the Christian principle around which society and culture have been organized. There is a double fallacy in such an approach. The first is that it gauges the existence and the vitality of the Christian principle in terms of traditions and institutions, and not in terms of a renewed confrontation with ever-changing realities. The second fallacy is that it severs morality and customs from the spiritual life and cleaves culture from religion. Religion and culture are not the same thing, but though they must not be confused, it is just as erroneous to sever them from each other. Any cleavage between religion and culture, any dualistic approach to the problem of their relation, injures the vitality and relevance of the Christian tradition. Yet this is precisely the guiding thought of many who today approach this problem, from Eliot to Bonhoeffer and Jacques Maritain. 
After 20 centuries of Christian thought and influence, these writers claim that the Christian era is just about to begin. They prophesy that henceforth Christianity will exert an influence equal to and probably better than that of the medieval Christendom, admitting, with Christopher Dawson, that not even the medieval church quite succeeded in a wholly Christianizing the heritage of Greek and Roman antiquity. Eliot eloquently states that Christianity has not yet fully spent its forces, but the validity of this claim in the light of contemporary events and realities can be examined more closely in the writings of Jacques Maritain. A Christian Philosophy of Culture For an examination of Professor Maritain's vision of a new age of Christian culture, we must turn to his classical and most authoritative work on this subject, published under the title True Humanism. Although in this work Maritain expresses firm opposition to any kind of dualism, any kind of dichotomy between religion and culture, nonetheless he unconsciously slips into it time and again. For the religious and cultural pluralism which Maritain advocates is essentially a concealed dualism. It is a dualism which in effect is trying hard to fill the gap of nonsense left by the disappearance of a transcendent god. Instead of concerning himself with this paradox, and instead of examining the legitimacy of the world born of the Renaissance and the Reformation, Maritain excoriates these two periods for what he regards as their half-truths and immediately asserts that today's struggle is principally centered on this alternative. Either a purely atheistic position in action, or a purely Christian position in raison d'etre. Maritain is realistic enough not to favor the idea of a return to the Middle Ages, which he considers completely gone and unavailable for the present or for the future. Though medieval Christendom had the sense of unity, Maritain admits that the Christian ideals and the ethical demands of the gospel had not yet been purified, had not yet been grasped in their radical exigencies, as they were afterward through the great upheavals and trials of the modern period. But the modern period achieved the other extreme vis-a-vis -vis the Middle Ages. While the latter strove after a sense of unity between religion and culture, the former exhibits an oscillation between a religious loyalty and a rather profane and sentimental naturalism. Not that the modern age does not display any humanism, it does, but this humanism is all too human. It is thoroughly anthropocentric. What Maritain seeks is its substitution by a true humanism, that is, one which recognizes both the existence of an absolute superior to the order of the universe itself and the supratemporal value of the soul. Such a humanism Maritain considers basic and necessary to the creation of a new civilization. This civilization will be new, not only by contrast with the inhuman regime which agonizes under our eyes and was fostered by the spirit of the Renaissance and the Reformation, it will be new especially in relation to the Christendom of the Middle Ages. By contrast with the latter, it will not be sacral, but profane. The cardinal difference between these two concepts of civilization is felt more sharply if it is realized that while the medieval was not pluralistic, Maritain's is. This pluralism is held together by a common but minimum ideal, expressed thus, whoever is not against you is with you. For the medieval conception of an absolute end, namely the beatific vision of God, Maritain substitutes a practical concern for common action regardless of the ideological goal, if that concrete action does not contradict the principle of an absolute above and beyond man. With this as a cornerstone of his system, Maritain pays his respects to the necessity of defining Christianity in terms of the contemporaneity between faith and secularity and to the obligation to heal any cleavage between religion and culture, faith and morality. This necessity and this obligation are all the more imperative because the future of Western civilization rests on a choice which, according to Maritain, lies between an anthropocentric or anti-humanism and a humanism of the incarnation, or theocentric humanism. Maritain contends that the anthropocentric humanism of the modern period stems from the optimism of the Renaissance and the pessimism of the Reformation, on the one hand. On the other, it is the legacy of the decadent bourgeoisie. Originally opposed especially to medieval humanism, modern humanism was seriously injured by Darwin and then by Freud, so that God becomes a mere idea, 
gradually deprived of any transcendence, and ultimately bound to die or to be assimilated with the unfolding of history. Maritain has also in mind Nietzsche, Hegel, and dialectical materialism, or communism. This kind of humanism is, according to Maritain, far from being rational. It is even opposed to reason. The tragedy of anthropocentric humanism is that it has resulted in tidal waters of irrationalism, which are now sweeping Western culture under the name of racism and materialism. It is as if optimism is bound to lead to irrationalism as soon as it assigns a purely temporal destiny to man. The Christian kind of humanism is not without some equivocal characteristics. In its Protestant trend, it is still essentially archaic and reactionary, even pessimistic. There is a more Catholic trend which Maritain upholds because it is integralist and progressive. Only this trend can usher in a new age of Christian culture. This new age would be characterized by three important aspects. A redefinition of the concept of man, centered in the idea or in the rehabilitation of the idea that man is a creature of God. A reassessment of culture and society, which Maritain envisages as the transfiguration of the temporal order, and the necessity of tolerating heresies, that is, conflicting ideals, as long as they do not prohibit community of action, or as Maritain says, because opportet heresies esse. It is at this point that Maritain's edifice shows some weaknesses. He stipulates that this new age of Christian civilization must be founded on the distinction between the spiritual and the temporal orders, between religion and culture. This distinction appears to be in agreement with the biblical view, but the agreement is merely superficial. It conceals a readmission of the classical error of dualism between heaven and earth, body and soul, together with the resultant dichotomous view of religion and culture. Maritain writes that culture is merely concerned with terrestrial matters, but the goals of religion are supra-terrestrial, and that such a differentiation is essential to Christianity. Any attempt which presents the Christian faith in a mode susceptible to act as a leaven in molding the spirit of the contemporary world, yet thwarts or belittles the intrinsic worth and the needs of that spirit, is a sign of an inherent weakness of Christianity. In the light of this, the principles which guide Maritain's understanding of the relation between religion and culture and his hope for a new Christian civilization appear as falling considerably short of the necessities of the present age. Turning in accordance with the Aristotelian tradition of scholasticism, to the distinction between the speculative and the practical orders, in art and scholasticism, Maritain restates the two exercises of the practical reason, doing and making. The first deals with ethics and politics, while the second deals with poetics, with the arts. One deals with moral action, the other with productive action. The higher sphere of morality is the sphere of the moral virtue par excellence, prudence. And what is the principal aim of morality, the main goal of prudence? Maritain answers this question by saying that this action is ordered to the common end of all human life, and it has a part to play in the perfection peculiar to the human being. The value of an act is related, even relative, to the perfection peculiar to the human being. Action or morality thus simply refer to the goal of perfecting man, in contrast to making, which is a kind of productive action, considered in relation to the things produced only, and not in relation to the common end of all human life. Productive action, that is to say, artistic and technological creativity, is related to the perfection, not of the maker, but of the thing made. In everything that is made, in every work of art, there are two elements. One is formal, and the other material. Controlled by the mind of the maker, the formal element is what constitutes each kind of art and makes it what it is. The material element, on the other hand, distinguishes the perfection of the thing made from that which is peculiar to the human being. Accordingly, it is not surprising that Maritain should acknowledge that it is difficult, therefore, for the prudent man and the artist to understand one another. It seems as if the respective exigencies of the two spheres of the practical order do not necessarily coincide. But granted that art and morality constitute two autonomous worlds, they are liable to enter into conflict regarding their respective perfection. In The Responsibility of the Artist, 
Maritain tries to overcome this problem. Devoted to the ethics of art, that book studies the relation between artistic creativity and ethical action in terms of the moral responsibility of the artist on the one hand, and on the other, in terms of the perfection of the work in relation to the perfection of the artist's soul. From the beginning and throughout the essay, Maritain emphasizes the respective autonomy of art and morality. Neither is subordinated to the other in a direct and intrinsic fashion. However, an indirect and extrinsic subordination is allowed between them. Its special purpose is to exclude any conception of art for art's sake, as well as propaganda art. While art for art's sake seems to vindicate the autonomy of art, it does so at the expense of the autonomy of morality. By contrast, propaganda art violates the autonomy of art. This means that Maritain's conception of the respective autonomy of art and morality does not rule out the possibility of their unity in the person of the artist. On the contrary, it is from this perspective that Maritain views the worlds of art and morality. And if these worlds constitute independent spheres, it is no less true that they remain concentric. Why? Because Maritain reverts to the strict Aristotelian distinction between the speculative and practical orders and observes that both art and prudence are virtues of the practical intellect. Nonetheless, the difference between art and morality remains. The first responsibility of the artist is toward his work. Maritain quotes Oscar Wilde, The fact of a man being a poisoner is nothing against his prose. The end of art, which is beauty, is supreme with respect to the work, while the end of prudence, which is the good, is, the, is supreme with respect to the man. Therefore, when these two ends are conjoined in man, they form one absolute, which is the Greek ideal of the kalo kagathos. The artist is a man before being an artist. As such, he is responsible to the good of human life, in himself and in his fellow man. Maritain here declares that the autonomous world of morality is simply superior to and more inclusive than the autonomous world of art. This assertion hangs on the principle that there is no law against the law on which the destiny of man depends. In other words, art is indirectly and extrinsically subordinate to morality. Evidently, everything depends on what is meant by morality. It need not be moralism and prudery. One might even find in Maritain's understanding of morality more than a mere possibility of accord with that of Albert Camus. By morality, Maritain means essentially charity, just as Camus' description of engagement or commitment hangs on his concept of love. Both do in effect consider a strict union between action and art, but Maritain expresses this union in terms of the relation between the perfection of the work itself and that of the maker. Relying on Thomas Aquinas, Maritain defines perfection as the point when any being or anything reaches its end. Thus, Ultimate perfection means union with God, and such a union with God can only be achieved through charity. It is here that Maritain leaves his theory open to the criticism that, though his understanding of perfection is based on charity, it does not quite refrain from depriving the object of this charity from any intrinsic worth. The fact that love itself, or charity, is defined purely in terms of the supraterrestrial reality can only signify that the union with God is but the ultimate expression of an otherworldly hope, and it is questionable whether this hope can deal with the realities of the world otherwise than by asking man to renounce them. And the present predicament of Christianity in its strained relation with the culture it has fostered, one may wonder whether such an otherworldliness is opportune. Yet this attitude is adopted at a moment when, at least theoretically, most Christian leaders are conscious of the paramount need of contemporaneity, and when seemingly this effort to let Christianity keep abreast of the time is most conspicuous in every quarter. But always, some kind of otherworldliness seems to dilute the reality and the effect of Christianity's encounter with the world. This can be felt even when Maritain writes with apparent wisdom. The most disincarnate artist has a concern, concealed or repressed as it may be, to act upon souls. As Sartre would say, no author writes for posterity or even for himself alone. Moreover, the work of art involves not only a technique, 
but also the whole being of the artist, even of the artist qua man and not simply qua artist. Indeed, art depends, in Maritain's words, on everything which the human community, spiritual tradition, and history transmit to the body and mind of man. Just as, because art belongs to a time and a country, it has an obligation toward the community. Once again, Maritain's theory shows its defect. He grants the world of art its autonomy only to make sure that it subordinates itself to the world of morality. Indirectly and extrinsically or not, the subordination is there and it is emphasized. It is morality itself which judges the quality of the work of art. Maritain admits the possibility of a conflict between the good of the work and the good and ultimate end of man. What must an artist do under such circumstances? Maritain's answer is unambiguous. He declares that the only solution for such an artist is to change, not his work, as long as he remains what he is, but him, himself. Then his artistic conscience itself will require of him another kind of work. But what happens to the other work toward which he is counseled to change? Is it still to be considered as art or not? Maritain's theory does not offer any answer. Why? Perhaps because there is a gap between the Christian definition of man and the understanding of human nature, which evolves out of the unhindered work of man's imagination. Maritain has not, despite his awareness of the need for contemporaneous Christian action, removed the barrier which separates this world from the next, and Christianity from the culture of today. In 1880, E. de Présence observed the death of Christian philosophy precisely because it then seemed to become a mere reapparition from the 13th century. The mistake of Jacques Maritain is not that he believes in the reality of a transcendent God. It is that he does not disassociate this belief sufficiently from the supernaturalism peculiar to the 13th century. It is one thing to affirm that man is an animal who lives on transcendentals, but it is another thing to affirm that the reality of immanentals participates in the power of the transcendent, or that the transcendent manifests itself in the immanentals only within the realm of the Christian church. By asserting that the church alone, as a temporal and social community, seeks and realizes a common good which participates in divine truth, Maritain deprecates the intrinsic worth of all other temporal community. Surprising as it may sound, this is the reason why he chooses to place the good of the work of art in a subordinate position with respect to the good and ultimate end of man. Maritain defines the perfection of the work in such a way that it is consubstantial with the perfection of the soul, which every man, by virtue of being a man, must seek. In these terms, the artist must be a saint. Maritain's positive approach to the independent reality of culture is but a pretext better to absorb it into the realm of an otherworldly reality, namely the Christian tradition. But he does not thereby salvage it from its increasing irrelevance. For if the artist must endeavor to become a saint, his art is superfluous. As Moriach has said, if one were a saint, one would not write novels. Nor would one be a doctor, nor a politician, nor to use Maritain's own words, anything here below, save perhaps a monk. Maritain ass asserts the autonomy of art in regard to morality, as well as its extrinsic and indirect subordination to the latter. This assertion leads to the core of the predicament of contemporary Christianity and its inability, even inaptitude, to speak to the modern situation. All that Maritain's theory of aesthetics, all that his ph religious philosophy of culture achieves is to reassert, even if mildly, the old deprecation of life here on earth. Maritain, like many other Christians throughout the ages, speaks highly of culture and the arts. He is even more than many another concerned about their vitality under a Christian influence. Yet his views reveal the same spirit of otherworldliness and contempt for this world on which centuries of Christianity have thrived. I could have become a saint, said Léon Blois, a worker of wonders. I have become a man of letters. Here, as in the case of Maritain, there is more than merely a question of subordination which is involved. 
as well as something other than an intellectually legitimate attempt to correlate two realms of human existence, art and morality. In Bloy's statement, as in Maritain's theory, it is the implicit disparagement of the world as it is, of the intrinsic worth of the creation, which is shocking. It is a question, therefore, whether any rethinking of Christianity in contemporary terms can be relevant so long as no simultaneous attempt is made to dislocate and expel the habits of life denial which have characterized Christianity. The problem is as simple and unambiguous as Marx expressed it. It is easy to become a saint if one does not want to be a man. Father Panelou's behavior in Camus' novel, The Plague, is an illustration of that kind of ideal. To be a man, this is today's problem as it has always been. Neither Marx nor Camus have given it originality. But Christianity has tended to disregard it for the sake of a supernatural concern which is deleterious to human existence here on earth. Today's battle is not waged in the spaces between heaven and hell. It is fought within man himself, for or against him. That is the real issue. Maritain's pluralism is a refusal to face the problem. The problem is further complicated by the fact that while Maritain acknowledges the skepticism of today's culture, he does not quite take it seriously. Indeed, there is something disingenuous in the argument that a return to absolutes will eliminate skepticism. In advocating pluralism, Maritain simply sweetens the pill. It is the diagnosis itself which is wrong. The loss of absolutes cannot be remedied by an adulterated appeal to unidentified absolutes. St. Thomas Aquinas' absolute had a definite identity which authenticated his system of thought and his beliefs. Maritain's absolute is neither a reference to the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, or Jesus Christ. It suggests the God of the philosophers, who have ceased to believe in any. Maritain's attitude is less courageous than that of Camus. At least Camus dared to draw all the consequences from the death of God, to the point of facing the absurdity of human existence, and to the point of despairing until a, until a new hope was born, until a new ethic was felt and sketched. In Maritain's system, the disappearance of God is glossed over, and for lack of any affirmation of God's existence in the fashion of the old schools, Maritain either wishes that all our absolutes were summed up in his God, or he does not refute the death of God. Maritain's absolute is an apparition. It shows that the predicament of Christianity, which attempts to be contemporaneous with its concomitant culture, is even greater than one which does not care about it or declares itself purely and simply otherworldly. Maritain himself realizes this difficulty. In true humanism, he contemplates the new regime of Christian civilization as differing from the medieval one and that it would not be sacral but profane. But here, too, the distinction is merely verbal and does not affect the core of the problem. It offers no new departure for a new Christian culture and thus offers no new and viable challenge. The passage from a sacral to a profane emphasis is not going to alter decisively the chances and the opportunity of a Christian culture. It is merely a question of semantics. Even as Maritain likes to speak of absolutes which distantly recall St. Thomas's God, so also he favors for lack of any other possibility, a profane culture which is but a substitute for the irretrievable sacramental culture of the Middle Ages, since no one can humanly hope to resuscitate the latter today. What Maritain's cultural philosophy amounts to is a proclamation that things would be better if they were under a Christian influence. This constitutes a recognition that they are not. To advocate that a profane culture must be erected which would replace the sacral culture of the Middle Ages, constitutes more than a de facto acknowledgement that the Christian principle is losing control of the cultural structures of modern society. It is one thing for a Christian to believe that the powers that be draw their authority from God. It is another thing whether the powers that be themselves believe it. Although a Christian could make his own some of Karl Marx's indictments of the bourgeois morality and economy, the fact is that Marx formulated them in a sense hostile toward Christianity. It is as if, throughout the ages, Christianity had learned less from its historic sins and mistakes than it reluctantly did from the attacks and corrections of its detractors. 
there must come a time when the detractors take over the leadership. Maritain is unwilling to realize that his scheme for an integral humanism is such that it hardly conceals the influences of secular thought upon his own understanding of Christianity. He once wrote that the misfortune of classical humanism was that it was anthropocentric. The predicament of Maritain's humanism is that it deliberately wants to be profane, but not anthropocentric. It wants to honor life and the world without deriving this honor from the intrinsic worth of either this life or this world. Just as he subordinates art to morality and thus honors it, so also he subordinates this life and this world to a supernatural reality and thus hopes to honor them. Is this the kind of civilization Maritain wishes to see as a real possibility? Perhaps this is all that a Christian civilization can be in the future, but will it really be a civilization? And just how far or how different is Maritain's neo-Thomistic civilization from the ideals of pragmatism? Is not what he calls pluralism another label for pragmatism? It seems that Maritain is only trying to save the concept of God by substituting for it the concept of an absolute. But this concept of the absolute is related to man or founds man's self-understanding in a way no different from William James's definition of God as the ideal of everything. Such is the Christian humanism underlying Maritain's conception of civilization. This humanism, Maritain says, has been absent from the concern of modern man during the past four centuries. Now man has come full circle, realizing the nonsense of that inhuman humanism which was centered on man rather than on God. Maritain thinks that no new humanism is conceivable if it is not inspired by a Christian philosophy, a philosophy of the supernatural, of the emotional as well as the supraterrestrial end of man. The higher the point of departure, the better this new humanism will inform, shape, and direct man's destiny in the framework of a long-needed new civilization. And, Maritain adds, from what height can such a humanism be derived? From the height of saintliness. It is not from the depths and the finitude and limitations of man's condition that Maritain derives his humanism. The culture he contemplates is not really addressed to this man in this condition. His humanism is based on the life of the one who renounces life because it is not good enough, and yet it is the only one he has. Any culture based on such a humanism may be Christian and even pluralistic, but it will essentially be programmatic, and because it is blind to the limits and the possibilities of human nature, it will be counter-humanism at least from the present standpoint of man. Maritain's philosophy of religion and culture reveals the presence of an ineluctable dualism at its very base. This dualism permits Maritain to separate religion from the cultural framework and institutions of society. At the same time, it permits him to fill the gap thus created with the insertion of an absolute principle in terms of which both man and society are explained transcendentally. The result of this dualism is an otherworldly conception of religion. In a volume published in 1943, under the title of Sort de l'Homme, Maritain includes an essay in which he discusses the influence of religion on modern society and culture. In it, he clearly distinguishes the political meaning of religion from its evangelical significance. What he means is that the inner reality of religion, or faith itself, is existentially more authentic than the cultic and even charitable institutions by which religion is often known, that the otherworldly focus of religion is more important than its thisworldly concern. In the same essay, Maritain states his opinion that the evangelical conception will ultimately prevail over the political conception of religion. Not that Christianity will no longer use cultic and social institutions, but it will be free from them, especially the latter. It will inform the temporal structures of the world, but it will not be a part of them. Thus, he adds, the idea of a Christian state is today very remote. The Christian states of the past have now become bankrupt, apparently because, or in spite, of the fact that they were based on a political conception of religion. Though Maritain rejects the political conception of religion, he is compelled to avow that every Christian must wish for the ushering in of a really Christian world order, or a really and organically Christian state, which externally professes Christianity. This hope is not anywhere near realization, 
especially today when the old Christian states are disintegrating and giving way to various forms of totalitarianism, which arrogate to themselves the messianic visions of classical Christendom. How is it, then, that Maritan believes that a new Christian civilization is going to rise from the ashes of the modern world and from the constraint, the irrationalism, and the directionlessness of the present day? Together with its dualism, Maritan's philosophy of religion and of culture nurses a basic inconsistency. It is foolish to hope for a new Christian culture once Christianity has forsaken the temporal structures of this world. It is inconsistent to think that one can be had without the other. If any truth is to come from religion, it must deal with the present, this worldly condition of man. Even St. Thomas admitted that God had not for his own, but for man's sake, created everything for his glory. To be sure, in disassociating faith from the temporal structures of the world, Mariton intends above all to assert the primacy of the spiritual. It is evident that such primacy must always be asserted if any renewal, whether religious or cultural, is to be hoped for in a world torn between all kinds of ideologies. But such primacy must also show some efficacy in this world and for it. The primacy of the spiritual cannot be realized in and for this world in any other way, even if it must negate itself in order to be thus realized. Mariton's insistence upon religious and cultural pluralism within the framework of a reinvigorated Christian civilization has many merits, but not least of all, the recognition of alternatives to the Christian faith itself, and accordingly the recognition that all men belong together. But it would be a mistake to assume, therefore, that Mariton is attempting to reverse the age-old dogmatism and exclusivism of Christendom. It would be a mistake to think that this new version of a Christian culture distinguishes itself by its openness and an inherent attitude of tolerance towards heterogeneous elements. What Dr. Maritan's position clearly spells out is not the toleration of non-Christian elements. The converse is the case. Unconsciously, if not consciously, Maritan is presenting the fact that henceforth it is probably Christianity which will need the toleration of others. In accord with T.S. Eliot, Maritan too seems to think that it may turn out that the most tolerable thing for Christians is to be tolerated. But being tolerated is quite a different thing from occupying a position of influence upon the structures of a profane civilization under Christian inspiration. When the kind of profane culture Maritan envisions comes to pass, it may be that Christianity, now merely a tolerated religion, will have ceased to guide the destinies of men. To borrow Maritan's own terms, the relation between Christianity and culture must be direct and intrinsic. As soon as it becomes indirect and extrinsic, one is subordinated to the other. In the Middle Ages, culture was thus subordinated to religion. Whether Maritan likes it or not, and though he does not say it, his prospect is headed for the subordination of religion to culture. An extension of his own argument negates his expectation that the era now beginning is to be characterized by any form of Christian dominance.